Welcome to the Vile Balance HealthCast, episode number 354. One out of two Americans, 65 and older, are considered disabled. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Dr. Maupin and Brett are the authors of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about hormone replacement therapy for women, which is available on Amazon or from Dr. Maupin's office at BioBalance Health. Dr. Maupin's office is currently accepting new patients. We're going to be talking this week about preventative medicine as a strategy for taking care of your health as you age, but also as a strategy for changing the way the American medical system is structured and focuses its energies. Historically, uh, medicine has been sort of like a, a mechanic's shop for automobiles. When your car breaks, you take it in, you say something's broken, it makes this funny noise, uh, <laughs> can you fix it? And the mechanic scratches his chin and listens to your car or listens to your, and he says, does it make a beep, beep, beep noise or does it make a rrr, rrr noise? And then you all agree <laughs> on the kind of noise it might be making. And they say, oh, I think that's a water pump. So then they go in and they check and they see if it's a water pump. And if it is, they put a new water pump in. Medicine has done that for the last couple hundred years as the way that we handle medicine in America. But part of what is wrong with that as a system is that it doesn't teach us, train us, require us, or help us to live healthier lives so that the system doesn't break. So we don't want to be going to the doctor because we broke something and hope that they can fix it. We want the doctor to help us learn how to avoid breaking it in the first place. So there is a, there's a momentum in American medicine today to shift the dynamic from fix it after it's broken to prevent it from becoming broken. And that is a particular concern as we recognize that the American population as a whole is aging. Uh, in the next, by, by 2050, uh, almost 55, 60% of the American population will be over the age of 65. That means we're gonna have fewer people in the workforce. That means we're gonna have more people that are retired or have reduced their amount of productive work. Mm -hmm. And then we're gonna have more people that are sick and dysfunctional. And what's particularly of concern to Dr. Maupin and I today is some medical research that we ran across recently uh, that was uh, written in the Journal of Preventive Medicine. It's a research article that talks about strategies for uh, predicting which of the elderly population are going to be most likely to have uh, mobility issues and become disabled to the extent that they cannot perform one to three of what are called the activities of daily living. Uh, and, and they've developed a methodology for that. We're quite excited about that. We want to talk about that today. But, but mainly we want to talk about the fact that currently 42% of the population of the United States is over the age of 65. And 55% of those, which is over half, are qualifiable as disabled because they cannot perform some of the basic activities of day, daily living, such as walking for three blocks. Or getting out of a chair. Or getting out of a chair, transferring from one chair to another, uh, right, or right. out of a car with, with mm -hmm. any fluidity, any ease, uh, or, or capacity. You start to see more and more people that are older who need walkers and who need canes or who don't who need them and don't use them, mm -hmm. and therefore they struggle. I don't know if you've ever been to a Walmart on a, on a Saturday afternoon, watch these people drift around the aisle. They don't have balance. They don't have perceptive or, or uh, peripheral uh, vision, and they are not able to walk and talk at the same time because they can't concentrate on both of those things at the same time. And so they're in the way. And But the most concerning thing to me was that currently the population over 65 right. in the U.S., one out of every two people over 65 is considered disabled. Now, I, I've, I look, I, I'm very observant of the population and people who look disabled or can't walk or can't, or can't get out of a chair. And I didn't have any idea that it was half or more mm -hmm. of the population. So that, that's where I go ding. That's a big problem that no one really talks about. 
And it's a problem that we need to prevent this from being ongoing or we're going to end up having young nurses taking care of every half of everybody over 65. I need to correct my numbers because I'm, I'm just looking at the notes that I had. Mm -hmm. said in 26, there were 37 million adults over the age of 65. They, demographers predict that that will change to 87 uh, percent, uh, 87 million by 2050, which will be 20 percent of the population, not 60 percent of the okay. population. So 20 percent of the population, one in five Americans in 2050 will be over the age of 65. And half of them will be disabled. And half of them will be disabled. Or more than half. If the current trends continue. And we're talking about physical disability, not mental, not emotional. We're talking about physical disability where you don't have muscle strength, and we know that muscle decreases as we age unless we get testosterone, unless we exercise. But, but if you don't make these preventive moves, then you lose so much muscle that you can't perform daily living. You have to have somebody bring you your food. You have to have somebody take you to the mall or to church. I mean, you can't even shop you on your own. You can't live independently. You can't drive. You can't live independently. So so what are we going to do with people like this? Well, the younger generation is going to have to take care of them. And I'm not including myself or you in this because we've already taken preventive measures. Right. We are already... Well, that's what you're all the specialists. Yeah, we specialize in, in preventive medicine. And part of that is suggesting weight training to mm. build muscle mass and and checking on people to do that. We have a weight loss, uh, weight loss program because weight loss is the only way to, to combat obesity other than exercise. Right. And we also provide testosterone for muscle mass. So we are already attacking this issue. Mm -hmm. And in my office, I don't generally see a lot of people who, who can't get out of a chair unless they haven't been treated yet. Well, sometimes you do see them. They yes. haven't been treated. Mm -hmm. Once you have seen them, and we've told stories before, about a patient that you had who's come in in a wheelchair mm -hmm. and who was unable to do not only activities of daily living, but the things that he had been doing to maintain his uh, lifestyle and his income. Mm -hmm. And he could no longer do that. He, he repaired uh, properties that he owned mm -hmm. and he couldn't paint the wall or change out a window or yeah, clean the windows. he couldn't really or... walk. He had had a surgery on right. his hip and, it, and he had recovered five years before that. He was in his 80s and he had recovered... Well, when he still had enough testosterone to have muscle mass, the second hip, he couldn't get out of a wheelchair until we started treating him with testosterone. And then he recovered very well, went back to normal activity. Mm -hmm. which, I mean, no one lives forever, but he got back to his normal activity and right. and had had that at least five years before he had another illness. Right. So uh, there is an article in, in doing the research for this presentation. We also looked at an article in the Journal of Gerontology that was published in January of 2012. And Dr. Mm -hmm. Todd Manini and Dr. Brian Clark wrote that article. And this is what they said about this data. They said the scientific and medical communities have recognized that skeletal muscle dysfunction, e.g. muscle weakness, muscle atrophy, poor muscle coordination, etc., is a debilitating and life-threatening condition in older persons. For example, the age-associated loss of muscle strength is highly associated with both mortality and physical disability. Mm -hmm. And maintenance of muscle mass with advancing age is critical because it serves as a metabolic reservoir, reservoir that is needed to effectively right. withstand disease. So you have That's got to an amazing maintain, statement. Yes. And it's true. So, so what Dr. Maupin rep requires, basically, I mean, she didn't require, but she recommends I it. I cracked that whip. On it. Yeah. And now you're working out with weight. That, so. that people of a certain age need to do resistance exercise, not cardio. I mean, they need to do cardio still. Cardio is for their heart. But in addition to cardio, they need to do resistance exercise to maintain muscle strength. And as a preparatory ingredient for that, they need to replace their testosterone because the testosterone allows you to build the muscle strength and the muscle mass. Mm -hmm. So it's a one-two punch that will then take you out of this category where you are limited because of difficulty or lack of mobility because you don't have the strength to stand up out of a chair. You don't have the strength to climb a flight of stairs. You don't have the strength to walk two blocks and, and other limiting factors that come when you don't have muscles. And most of us don't really, most patients don't really realize what we're treating. They think they're coming in to get testosterone because they ache all over or they have an autoimmune disease or their sex life is, has decreased. But we have more of a mission than that. I mean, our, my, my long-term mission for, 
for uh, replacing testosterone in both sexes is for us to live a full life with full mobility and, and the ability to take care of ourselves and not depend on our children or grandchildren for that care, which is the perfect answer to the healthcare crisis that we have. Mm -hmm. We can't depend, we cannot keep spending what we spend on illness. We need to start spending some money or more money on prevention and we need to put the oil in our car basically, yeah. instead of just, just let, let it run until the engine right. seizes up, or we need to have better maintenance than we offer our cars and, and so, spend time on and effort on that. You know, uh, there's, there's a national commercial that's been around for years that the Fram oil filter commercial, where the mechanic <laughs> has a car up on the blocks that said they didn't put the oil in the car. And he said, I, c I have this oil filter that I can put in your car and change the oil and put the filter in. And he says, you can pay me now for this, or you can pay me later for this. And medicine is basically right. has been the same way. Mm -hmm. So part of the challenge then is to say, well, what can we do? If we're going to try to do preventative medicine, if we're going to try to take the right steps to avoid loss of mobility, loss of muscle strength, uh, is, are there predictors that we can look at to say, this person is more at risk than this person. This person is at this much risk. And these interventions will make a difference. These interventions that are doable at 50 or 55 can make a difference so that when you're 60, 70, 80, or 90, you still will be able to live independently and take care of yourself. I have a neighbor who's 93, mm -hmm. lives alone, and in the last two years has really begun to lose some of her muscle strength and some of mm -hmm. her mobility. Mm -hmm. And I, I watch her walk out in the morning to get her mm -hmm. paper and come back. I watch her out in the yard picking up sticks and limbs and things. And I talk to her. And she's worried about having to go into a nursing home mm -hmm. and leave her home, leave her house, leave her furniture, leave her stuff. Her children don't want it. And they don't want her house. They don't want her stuff. And mm -hmm. she's so distraught by all of that. But she is out there every day trying to work and move. Mm -hmm. so that she can maintain her strength. Mm -hmm. She says, if I sit down, I'm just going to disappear. Then I'm not going to be able oh, to that's a horrible live thought. alone. And if any of us can put ourselves in Project that ourselves position, out that. I mean, have the empathy to be that person, which is yeah. oftentimes how I try, I try to do that so I can feel what somebody else is feeling. Right. And, and you, you get into that situation and you think, what would I do? And, and there at 93, there's not a lot you can do right. to regain muscle mass, except for movement and exercise. Which and, is what she does. And every that's day. what she does. But if they, if she had, and she did pretty well, yeah. but if she had managed to, uh, prepare herself or be able to get her testosterone to last longer or right. to have it replaced, then she would have a longer period of health before she had to go into a nursing home for some illness. Right. This would not be facing her right now. Right. So we have to start early. And and starting early means we need to go back and require kids to do exercise in in school, have a you know, you know, have a sport even if they aren't good at sports, have some kind of physical exercise that they get used to. Yes. And if you get used to it, then you continue to do that the rest of your life. If you're older than that, you can still start a good habit and start using, uh, exercising three hours a week. That's not bad. And then walking from your car and walking upstairs. Well, for and instance, don't circle the parking lot looking for the closest <laughs> slot. Park further out. On, and walk. If the weather's acceptable. Park further out and walk to the store. Uh, right. and, and if you have uh, stairs at work. If you can climb those stairs instead of ride the elevator, mm -hmm. climb those stairs as many times a week as you can. Not every time, not when you're in a hurry, not when you're carrying a big load of stuff, but begin to retrain yourself to stay as physically active as you can. Yeah. I mean, I used to take my heels off mm -hmm. and run up the stairs at St. John's to a delivery and put my heels back on and go in, you know? So, I mean, that was good exercise. Yeah. I mean, I was rushing, but... <laughs> well, so, so we, again, if we're talking about preventive medicine, we're talking about identifying those markers. There are three markers that have been identified as significantly predictive for determining which among us are going to be those who lose their mobility, lose their muscle mass, lose their strength, 
lose their ability to have independent living. Mm -hmm. And if we can intervene with those that we can identify and teach them different ways to live, different ways mm -hmm. to function, then we can reduce the percentage of people that don't do these things and need the more intense involvement of the medical system mm -hmm. as they age. They're expensive. They cost mm -hmm. a lot of money. It costs money to hire somebody to come and move you from a wheelchair to a sitting chair to a bed three or four times a day. That's, I mean, that's, <laughs> and that's where our money's going to go. And that's been the argument for the last 20 years right. is we don't want to spend, the government doesn't want to spend money on prevention because they're spending all their money in their budget on sick people. Right. And th at some point we're going to have to cut to the chase and spend money on both. Right. I mean, that's just going to be how, how it works, but also try to get the patterns of Americans to be different. Well, but our belief is if we start spending some money on both by, by putting some money into the preventive end mm -hmm. and teaching people how to be healthier and give them what they need to be healthier, then mm -hmm. we save money on the back end. Mm -hmm. If you spend a little bit of money now in diagnosing and treating mm -hmm. and training people to live healthier lives, then they'll live healthier lives. And down the road, they won't be as expensive to the system. Well, the system doesn't pay for weight loss. Right. I mean, that's one thing. I mean, whatever they pay for usually is recommended by doctors. So if they don't pay for weight loss, they're certainly not going to pay for learning how to lift weights or do some resistance training. So they, they don't pay for it until you're ill right. and then you can't go backwards. Right. But one of the ways that I thought was ingenious, which is, is very inexpensive is, um, the way to test for this right. is grip strength. And so they have like, you know, you've seen those little yeah, the little machines where, little you, machines squeeze where your, you squeeze your hand. Right. And, and it and measures your muscle strength. Now, that's not 100% because I've had carpal tunnel. Right. My grip strength isn't what it used to be, but it's still but a lot better than this. But we're talking about averages in the population. Yeah. If we get everybody grip strength, there, there are three factors that they measure. Grip strength is one. Mm -hmm. uh, walking speed mm -hmm. is another. If you fall below 0. 0.6 meters per second, then you, the, the red alarms go off because mm -hmm. if you're already walking that slow, there's a shuffle and balance issue mm -hmm. that's in the offing. And as you get older, you're going to walk slower and be less able to go three blocks because mm -hmm. it's just too much energy consumption. Mm -hmm. You won't do it. You won't be able yeah, to do and that's it. How you so people weight, sit though. and they go home and they sit in front of the TV. And then, and then the third factor comes in, which is obesity. Mm -hmm. So they're looking at three ingredients that if you're in your 50s and you have these things tested, we can have alarms go off to say, you need to be doing some resistance training to build up your grip mm -hmm. strength so that you, your body is strong enough to support you right? and have you walk and be independent. And that'll help you lose weight. And, and you need to walk a minimum of three blocks a day. I mean, that's one of those activities of daily living is that you should be mm -hmm. able to walk that far. Mm -hmm. But walk a mile or two or three a day. Make yourself do that. Teach yourself to do that. Mm -hmm. Start out doing it every other day. Start out doing it every third day. But build in a progression because as you age, you will need that. Uh, and as you walk, mm -hmm. then make sure you maintain a steady pace. Don't, right. don't, don't. Don't slow down. Don't dawdle. Don't stop. I mean, I you know, so, stop, yeah, well, the roses and all that. I, I have a good friend who's 80 and who has literally lost the ability to walk and have a conversation. Whenever my friend thinks of something that's important to say, the whole group that they're with has to stop and listen and really respond. Hard. And, and then, they, so you get, you're so trying to get out So do you want to be that person? Do you want to be that person? get into the restaurant and you have to stop in a huddle three or four times because this person keeps thinking of something. And then they stop moving. And they stop moving. I and mean, that's very common. when they stop moving, everybody else has to stop moving. So you have this little crowd cluster. Uh, for me, I find it to be incredibly frustrating, but I, I'm working on my tolerance and my patience. Those are other issues. When you age, <laughs> you, don't are... wanna, you don't have apoplexy and have a heart attack and a stroke. So I'm working on calming myself down. <laughs> but it is very frustrating. And part of what I believe is that if this individual had done or could still do the preventive mm -hmm. training that we're talking about to build back some muscle strength, which requires them to get up and walk, mm -hmm. and they resist walking. But it's hard to make muscle after 65 because yes. we don't have, we, we have lost, I mean, women lose it earlier, but men lose it in their late fifties, but we lose our testosterone and that's how, that's the anabolic uh, steroid that we need, right. anabolic hormone that we need to build muscle and bone. So 
that's, I mean, that's our part of it. There are some people that can sustain it. I'm not saying that, but that, that's a very small portion of the population. So we're going to have to pay attention to both exercise, but we're also going to have to pay attention to uh, body sustaining hormones. Right. Because that, I mean, so I, it's, this made me, this well, made you, me afraid. When I looked at this, I thought, well, you know, we need, a, we need thousands of doctors doing what I do. Yes. To make these people come back. Or if they're on the edge, or if you're 59 and you're already starting to gain weight and you're starting to walk slower and, and you can't pick up things and your grip strength is, is bad, then, I mean, you can, you can figure out all of these things yourself. But it, but it is a one-two punch. And you've always known, or you've known for years, yeah. like the first one, which is replacing the hormones, mm -hmm. in particular testosterone. The second one is we can now identify, we have tests that are cheap and expensive and easy to do anywhere to measure your, your grip strength and your walking speed and, that, and your obesity. That so, we can, we can then, we now know those are predictors. Right. We didn't know exactly what were predictors before. Now we know. So now we can look at those. And two of those I do every day in the office. Right. I go out to the waiting room to get my patients. I shake their hand. Sometimes as, you as can grip tell strength. grip strength and not grip strength, but right. you can tell a frail grip strength. Or and, really transfer out of a chair. You and watch I watch them get up, them get up out of yeah, a chair. And walk down the hall. And I watch them walk down the hall. Yes. So I kind of get an idea of whether someone has maintained muscle muscle right. uh, strength and uh, ability to get around. So so the, the first half of the message is you may need to consider replacing your testosterone that you have lost as you age so that you can have the foundation to maintain your muscle mass and your muscle strength. The second one is you can do this on your own. If you can't walk three blocks, if you can't get easily out of a chair, then you need to start doing some exercise mm -hmm. because exercise, both resistance weights and movement will help you be able to be healthier as you age to keep your mobility mm -hmm. and keep your independence. And we really, really encourage you to do those things for better quality of life. We want everybody to be healthy until the day they die. Thank you for listening. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.